Hey, I'm Zanzi and welcome to Farmers Inside Track episode 208. I'm your host, Dawn Umdu. Now, AgriColleges International has become a force in the agricultural education space with over 1,800 alumni in 40 different countries. In this edition, Veinand Esbach, Chief Operating Officer at AgriColleges International, talks about what makes their offering so unique and more about how agriculturalists can benefit. Welcome to Farmers Inside Track, Veinand Esbach. It's such a pleasure to have you with us. We've come a long way with agri-colleges as the Food from Zanzi team, as the Farmers Inside Track team. And it's so great to finally be able to welcome you and chat to you. I'm looking forward to our discussion today. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Dawn. It's wonderful finally getting around to it. I think we've been trying to set up for a while. Thank you for hosting me and for all the opportunities that uh, Food from Zanzi keeps giving to us as agri-colleges. Thank you so much. Now, I usually like to start with, you know, a bit of introduction of who I'm chatting to, where your journey in agriculture started, where Agricologists International came about, you know, maybe just as a start for people who may not know you, Venant. Born and bred farm boy, grew up outside Zanin in Limpopo. The area where I am now is about 25 kilometers um, out of Zanin in the Pulitzi Valley, uh, beautiful with subtropical fruit and indigenous forests just below Mahubas Kloof. Mahubas Kloof is quite well known to everyone out there as a very nice tourism attraction. And we're just literally the next valley down from Mahubas Kloof. I basically grew up in this valley as well. My dad worked for Westphalia Estate for many years and then later on relocated to Muketsi where my dad worked for ZZ2, the big tomato producers, for probably, I think it was 32 years as the senior manager on the avocado side. I worked there till he passed away last year. Been in the valley, in the area for many, many years at Amarantia Estate, where I am currently. Since 2002, joined Amarantia Estate, which is a family-owned farm owned by the Blight family. And I joined Howard Blight, the uh, um, owner, in 2002 as a nursery manager, a nursery assistant. And since then, I've sort of worked my way through the ranks to currently being the managing director of Amarantia Estate. That's where I've been for the last 20 years, doing all kinds of amazing projects, traveling Africa, diversifying into various other industries and other countries. Limpopo based all these years and loving what I do. It sounds absolutely amazing. And when you mentioned your dad working for ZZ2, I recall an interview that I did with the CEO and founder, absolutely amazing man. And it was such a pleasure to talk to him. And they do so many amazing things in that region. Thank you so much for sharing that and also sharing more about your journey within the sector. Now, more focused on Agricologists International, it has definitely become a force in the education space in recent years with over 1,800 alumni in 40 different countries. That's amazing. (laughs) Now, where did it all start and what is your recipe to success? What makes you just keep growing and growing in the space? Like I said, Amarantia State is quite a small farm and we also, our neighboring farms are Westphalia, ZZ2 and one other farm owner and they are all pretty big commercial farmers. And we are nestled in between all these big farms and only about a 140 hectare farm of which only 100 hectares is under production. So what we've realized over the years is that we need to diversify as a small farmer and spread our risks. And that's one of the principles that we sort of transfer to all our students as well. Go and look at opportunities. Go and see how you can diversify as an agribusiness. Don't get stuck into producing only one crop in one region to one market. And that's, I think, what we've achieved is spreading our risks and spreading our wings to other areas. So in 2008, the macadamia industry, which is one of our biggest products, basically the nursery, we produce anything up to 400,000 macadamia trees, mature trees a year, plus a whole patch of other small micro plants that we distribute all over the world. But the macadamia industry goes through these phases and it could have five, six, seven, eight wonderful years with the price climbing and climbing. And then all of a sudden there's a price adjustment and the price drops. And when that happens, like any farmer do, 
everyone gets into a bit of a panic and they stop farming macadamias until they see that it's recovered. Instead of basically assessing the risk and pushing through, because if you plant in the bad times, you're going to be in production in the good times. So in 2008, we went through one of these cycles and the macadamia industry came to a complete standstill. And we had about 50 to 60,000 trees in the nursery that we just couldn't sell. We couldn't give them away for free, actually. And all our farmers canceled nursery orders and we were not going to throw these trees away. And we just decided that we're going to diversify. We went out looking for potential partnership out there where someone had land and equipment and we could supply trees and some startup capital and we could plant however many hectares we could plant with those trees. And we couldn't find anyone locally that was willing to take a chance on macadamias. And we ended up with a partnership in Mozambique, the central Mozambique near the town of Chamoyo. And we established over a period of 2009 to 2015, we established about 350 hectares of macadamias and avos, also established a macadamia and avocado nursery. And that was the start of our big diversification. We since then started a nursery in Zimbabwe, a satellite nursery, also a satellite nursery, Zambia, Kenya. We're busy with Angola at the moment and quite a few other areas. And we also diversified into other industries and other businesses. So through all of this, we needed someone to assist on the farm. It was basically three of us managing the farm, nursery, administration, everything. So we needed staff. And that's where we realized we're going to have to employ some people. And looking for youngsters coming into the industry, we very soon realized that you could find someone with a qualification from one of the universities, a degree. That's great. But the challenge is that they come at a price. And we didn't want to go full on into big expenditure. We wanted someone with a diploma or a national certificate level that's come out of one of the colleges and we could employ them and train them up into specific field that we wanted to train them up. But we realized that the guys that was available out there that came out of the agricultural colleges and others over the last, call it 15 years, 20 years at that stage, the curriculum that they had studied was so outdated that it wasn't keeping up with the modern trends in agriculture. And that's where the whole concept of agriculture started. And we said that we're going to build a physical college as a starting point. But then we decided, no, it's not worth it. With all the fees must fall, movements and the space limitations. And let's rather look at online learning. And through a discussion with Stellenbosch University, we then came to realize that Yes, you can indeed go and look at short courses and even certificates in the agricultural space. That's where we started. So the recipe of to our success was finding the relevant technology, the best technology we could find out there to do what we wanted to do and not just accepting the first and best option available. And then bringing the concept of online learning and making it relevant to agriculture and also transferring the relevance of modern skills and modern technology into agriculture and showing the industry that agriculture is indeed a cool industry. We used to say we wanted to make agriculture sexy, but we've changed it slightly to making agriculture cool. And that's what we want to do. We've set ourselves a target of really making agriculture this career choice that is so cool that people want to go into it. And we've done quite a bit of that through also making our learning innovative and making it relevant to what is happening out there in the modern technology. To grab on your last point, agriculture is definitely becoming, you know, a career of choice. And there are many opportunities in the industry. But just, you know, reflecting on what you're saying in terms of how this journey came about and, you know, just diversifying from one thing to another and innovating, it sounds absolutely amazing. For anyone, you know, who's still deciding where they want to go, with their career in agriculture, or even just with their career as a whole, why should they consider the sector? And what would you say to them? Like I mentioned, it's what is making agriculture becoming a career opportunity that is so popular. And I think it's driven to a very large extent. It's driven by modern technology. The fact that food security is becoming such a massive issue. People are trying to live healthy and produce their own food. So it's really also been sort of driven by, despite all the 
terrible things that goes with the pandemic and the period that we were in lockdown and everything. It sort of changed the world. It changed the mindset of people. And people want to be healthy. They want to live healthy. And I think a lot of people came to realize that agriculture is one of those things that they could really grow their own food. Agriculture stepped up and really kept the economies of many, many countries going during the lockdown. And if you were growing vegetables and food in your back garden, it really assisted people that were struggling through the COVID time to survive. And it clicked in many people's minds that growing your own food is really something cool to do. You can control what you use as far as chemicals go, as far as fertilizer goes. You, you can control what you grow. You can control the, the water that you're using. To a large extent, you are basically feeding yourself with whatever you want to put into your body. And that's become a really, really cool thing for people to do. The combination of modern technology, food security, the fact that you can look after your family and yourself has really turned agriculture on its head and it's become this cool vibe. And it's also driven by social media, I think, plays a massive role. So if you go into social media now, I mean, you guys do a brilliant job in putting it out there. But if you go and look at social media, the people that are featured, the influencers in the agricultural industry, those are people that are making a living out of featuring themselves doing things in agriculture. And those influencers play a massive role in educating our youth on the wonderful thing that is agriculture. I also think what's gone in the right direction is the way that female empowerment has stepped up in agriculture. We're very proud to say that last year we were awarded a recognition award from an international association for recognizing female empowerment in the agricultural education space. That is because what we've done is we've really tried to communicate to our market out there that agriculture is not just for men. Agriculture is a career of so many choices and you can literally be a social media influencer that relies on agriculture and then agriculture is your career. You can be a drone operator and agriculture becomes your career. So there's so many things that is added onto just the normal farming out in the sun all day that has turned into a career of choice that so many women are choosing agriculture as a cool career. And we've managed to step up from our first intake of national certificate students in 2018 we had 7.7% female students in our total student intake that year. And in 2021, we managed to step that up to 38.7%. So that was a huge achievement for us to jump it up by 31%. And also the youth coming out of schools, seeing that agriculture is a way to look after your family and secure yourself for your future. It's really turned in the right direction for everyone. And I would just basically say to anyone that's still undecided, don't discard agriculture as an old-fashioned career choice. Go and look at the modern, relevant topics that you want to study and see what the applicability is in agriculture in our current environment. I think we can probably talk about this all day. Um, and I and I love your passion for it. And I love how you're just describing it so beautifully and making me just fall in love with it even more than I am already. <laughs> Thanks so Thanks. much for that. Now, you know, it being a very hands-on industry, many people have their reservations regarding the teaching of agriculture in an online environment. How do you overcome this? I think I'll keep it short because I've said a lot of it already, but um, the innovation that is behind our learning system we're not just basically taking a book and putting it behind glass. That is something that we are very, very strong about. We don't want agriculture to be seen as just this boring thing. And turning it into an online course was a really big challenge for us. But we've had to go and innovate. And we innovated through many different things that we brought in. And the different types of practicals that we apply in our coursework, the gamification that we've brought in. So you're not just, if people think of online learning, they think of a lot of reading, they think of a lot of sort of screen time. But what we've really tried to do is bring in little interactive 
things. For example, the typical thing, word searches that you can do in every magazine, there's a word search. We've brought in word searches. We've brought in flip cards. So instead of just having a straightforward definition and you have a word and you've got to match it to a definition, we have a definition. And if you flip the card, it's got the, the word on the other side. So little things like that is just things that's worked in our market and people have really started to enjoy it. We brought in a lot of video material. Now, from the beginning, we said video material is high risk because firstly, data is expensive, but we have found a way to really bring it down to where our national certificates require less than one gig of data a month to really study online. So we've really brought it down and it's made it affordable. But the risk is still there that students don't go and look at a video that's seven minutes long or four minutes long. They click on it, they open it for the first two seconds, and they flick past it. And that's what's literally happening in every online course that I've seen anywhere. So what we've brought in is something that also pauses the video. So we can play the video for one minute. We pause the video, and it pops up with a multiple choice question or a true or false or whatever it is that's based on the first minute of content in the video. They have to answer the question to be able to continue to the next part of the video. And through doing this, we've built some quizzing and assessment into the video at various stages. And that has now forced the students to actually learn through the videos. And that's also taken a huge part of the practical and brought it onto the online platform because they can see the physical work being done. There's always a place for physical on-site practical, and we never deny that. And we have catered for that in some of our courses and the way that we're rolling out our courses. But I think this is just the starting point of how we've managed to bring in the sort of practical element into our coursework. So, Venant, I think you've actually answered a large part of my next question around the concept of the different types of practical trainings that you do offer in terms of just the online and merging that then with the practical aspect as well. But maybe if you can just explain the elements just for those that might not understand it or know how you guys operate. There are two main aspects. We call it remote practicals and the other one is on-site practical. So your remote practical is a typical example that I like to use. Let's say you've got to take a leaf sample. Now, you're not taking a leaf sample that you're going to now analyze and look at the different elements in the leaf. That's not the learning. The learning is how to take an accurate leaf sample that can be sent to a laboratory that will do the analysis because no farm or very few farms have their own facility where they will analyze the leaf on farm. So we don't need to train the student in how to analyze the various elements in the leaf. We just need to train the student in taking the leaf sample successfully without contaminating it and getting it properly marked and submitted to the laboratory. So if we want to submit the leaf sample, how do you take the leaf sample? What are the steps to take the leaf sample? And this is a typical remote practical that the students can do anywhere in the world. So we've had students that had to do soil samples sitting in a high-rise building in Dubai studying our macadamia course, and they had no access to a macadamia farm, but they didn't need to. They could go to their local nursery in Dubai, and they could go and buy three, four different pot plants, and they can explain how they would do the soil sampling based on the different pot plants. So that is the advantage of the remote practical. The students would now go through the theory on how to take a leaf sample on the platform. There might be a video clip that shows the 12 steps. Um, It might just be written content. Then they have to go out and they get a task that they have to complete and they go into their back garden or wherever they want to go and they go and film themselves doing this or take photo evidence of them doing it. They can also go and do it on a farm where a supervisor or farm manager needs to sign off that they were witness to the students doing it. And when they get back to connectivity where they have internet, They then just submit all that evidence onto their online platform through syncing their mobile app with the online learning platform. And within seconds, it's on their platform. And from there, they either share it with their classmates or they basically turn it into a presentation or a Word document, whatever they want to submit it as into the platform for grading by the assessor. And then the other element is the on-site practical. And the on-site practical 
we use it more as an exposure visit. So there are some activities where the students get their hands dirty. They might serve as a tractor. They might build an erosion wall, inject the cattle, whatever it is. But it's also an exposure visit. So we like to take the students to some of the bigger farms out there or even medium and small farms and show them what it is that the farmers actually get up to day to day. And that exposure visit or on-site practical is built into some of the short courses, but all our national certificates have them. And that's where the students just love getting out there in the industry, working on the farm, um, sharing knowledge with, with some of the experts out there. And I think that contributes a very big part to the success of what we've achieved. Thank you so much for that context. Now, Venan, just in terms of, you know, the future, where is Agricologist heading as far as course development goes and what's next on your radar? At the moment, we've got quite a number of courses under development. We, we already have rolled out a number of introductory courses and fundamental courses. And just to explain very briefly the different phases, so an introductory course is a very short generic introduction to plant production or agribusiness or animal production. And then the next level of course is a fundamental course. And that's where it goes into a specific crop or a specific product. So there we've rolled out maize, macadamias, avocados, agribusiness, good agricultural practices. There's a whole lot under production in that category, and that includes irrigation, poultry, mango production. We're developing cassava with an industry partner from Nigeria, pig farming, robotics. And then we're also looking at your more modern farming or more modern careers in agriculture, and that includes the likes of rooftop gardening, urban farming, hydroponics. We already have an aquaponics course. And then long-term, more national certificates. We are busy with our accreditation with the Council of Higher Education and the Department of Higher Education. And once we are accredited, we will be rolling out higher certificates and eventually up to diploma level. But that's to come in the future. That's basically where we are. Keep an eye on what is needed out there in the industry. We work very closely with leading subject matter experts in the industry. Let's use the irrigation course, for example. We decided we were going to roll out an irrigation course because a lot of our students were asking on very specifically an irrigation element that it's covered in short in the national certificates and in some of the short courses, but they wanted to do a more detailed course on the different types of irrigation, irrigation maintenance, irrigation design. And we approached Felix Reinder, who used to be the chairman of the SA Irrigation Institute. And with Felix as our subject matter expert, we then went and we created an irrigation course. And it's actually going through its testing phase now to be rolled out in the next couple of months. So we rely on the industry experts out there. By no means do we give ourselves out as the experts. We are the experts on online learning. And we've won eight or nine international awards for what we've done on our, in our learning platform. But we still rely on the partners out there in any industry to come in and take our hand in ensuring that we give the students the best possible knowledge available. Thank you so much, Vainant. I think you've given me so much to think about in terms of learning, how to do it, that it shouldn't just be limited to maybe the very traditional way we see it happening within the sector and that there are other options available. But maybe just as we wrap up, where can prospective students or anyone that might, you know, be looking to collaborate with you get hold of you? Our website has all our contact details on. So I think the best is always to just go on to www.agricolleges.com or just to drop us an email. Students of inquiries can do so at study at agricolleges.com. There's also an inquire now button on our website where they would just fill out a very short questionnaire and submit that and that will pop through to us. So yeah, any of the social media channels, our email addresses are all on the website and telephone numbers, everything is on the website for anyone that wants to get hold of us for any collaboration or student inquiries. And that brings us to the end of this edition. Thank you so much once again for joining us here on Farmers Inside Track. That is Veinand Espach, the Chief Operating Officer at Agricologist International. Now from me, Do Numdu, our producer Megan van der Fent, and the rest of the Food for Mzanzi team have an absolutely amazing week. 
Bye for now. Life in South Africa can be a lot. I mean, scroll through Twitter for a minute and tell me I'm wrong. Thank God for South Africans though, right? We're inspiring and even on the bad days, we fight back with a smile. That's why I love Food for Mzanzi so much. They're not ashamed to celebrate the ordinary unsung heroes who work every day to put food on our nation's tables. Go to foodformzanzi.co.za and never miss an inspiring story.